God bless everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, my name is Phil Fisher, and I am in a desert place. The message tonight is one of those prophetic messages that only comes from being on your hands and your knees and humbling yourself before the Lord. Exactly one year ago today, I taught part one of this message, so it seemed only fitting since I'm in the middle of the desert to teach part two. And I wanted to teach it to you from a desert place because many of us right now are in a desert place. 150 years ago, it would have been dangerous to be here because let me tell you something, the Paiute Indians had all of this. And if you even rolled through here, you would be completely in trouble. Wild horses and snakes and, and scorpions are what we have tonight to keep us company. Tonight's message is gonna be prophetic because deserts are one of those places that are just magical. Desert places without a survival skill set are very, very uncomfortable for humans. I can tell you that right now. Deserts lack a source of water, so the most important plants never grow, and the animals that live there are often very mean and very poisonous. But the deserts you encounter can be literal or they can be metaphorical deserts. But in the Bible, we learn that these desert places are the most very places where God really gets people to change. But many of us, even though we are in a desert place, even though we are feeling the heat, we are still fighting against God. Many Christians, even some of us in this very room, have become so used to living in the desert that we have become spiritual gypsies. We have been roaming from one desert place to another desert place. Keep going from place to place to place to place. We wander through desert places our entire lives, raising our kids along the way, taking care of aging parents along the way, avoiding the obstacles that come with life along the way. It was on my knees last night at 2 a.m. in the morning that I discovered something that I want to share with every single one of you. Trying to navigate a desert place in your life is impossible without Jesus. If you try to do it without God, Satan will use the de desert place to drain your hope, to drain your faith, to drain your walk with Christ. And eventually, he will suck every ounce of your joy from you. And once the joy is gone, Satan has won because he knows you will turn to other places for joy. When he has stolen our joy, we find ourselves again in the desert place, looking toward the horizon, looking out there for a life we once wish we had. What do you do when the blessings you have been seeking all of your life are on the other side of a desert place that you don't want to cross? Why don't you want to cross? Why are you stuck here? We're going to find out tonight. Let's pray. Dear Father God, dear Lord in heaven, thank you so much, Father God, for allowing me to preach the word of God to you tonight from a desert place. Thank you so much, Father God, for the wild horses that are behind us, Father God. Thank you so much, Lord, for all the life that has thrived here, Father God. Father God, I ask that you give a special blessing to those of us that are in the desert place, spiritually in our lives right now, Father God. Lord, I ask for a breakthrough for those that are in a desert place, Father God, that are sitting there stuck in their desert place because there is nothing that they can do, Lord. They're afraid of getting out of their desert place, Father God. Father God, I pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth for a breakthrough tonight from those that have been stuck in a desert place. There is nothing that grieves the Holy Spirit more as when we look out over our lives through a stained window, stained with the blood of our sins at a life that we could have had if we would have stepped into Jesus, if we would have believed everything that we, we were told, if we would have really pushed into Christ. Tonight, I want to preach about a blessing that is on the other side of that desert place. Tonight, I want to preach about a breakthrough that is waiting to be answered for many of you. In Israel, there is a desert just like this. And just like this valley, in the distance behind me, there's a valley there in Israel. It's called the Valley of Baca. And it is still there today. It's an ancient valley that is mentioned in Psalms 84. At the very moment in history 
when Psalms 84 was written, every Jewish man was required to go to Jerusalem to celebrate the feast three times a year. It was very, very important that Jewish men celebrated this feast three times a year. And before they would celebrate this feast, they would go on a journey. Jewish people no longer take this journey, this journey in modern times because the second temple was destroyed. But back in the days before the destruction of the second temple, all Jews made this pilgrimage and they would use a shortcut to Jerusalem through the Valley of Baca, which looks much like this. It was a dry and dusty place. It was a dangerous place. It was a desert valley with little or no water. It was a place that was hostile to life. Bandits and thieves populated the valley back in the day. In the northern part of the valley, there was an area <clears throat> where the road to Jericho crossed. And we know, remember the parable about the Good Samaritan? That was the road to Jericho. Life in the desert valley was hard. Would you choose a life like this? The only thing that survives out here are cacti, Joshua trees, scorpions, and wild horses. It's hot out here. I'm thirsty out here. Do you want to be in this place forever? Do you really want to be in this place forever? But some people did. Some people lived in the valley of Baca, crouching next to the small clay and straw huts that they would build. They would drag water in there and make mud, and they'd build these little <clears throat> huts that they would squat out of living in. And all of them would go there before the great pilgrimage and build their huts all along the valley of Baca because then they could beg for any money from any one of the Jews that were traveling along the valley of Baca. Why? Because they knew that the Jews were there to repent. Walking along the valley, they weeped because they repented. In Hebrew, the valley was known as the Valley of Weeping because three times a year, the Jews walked along this valley and they would cry. They would want to purge themselves of sin. So why were the Jews weeping? They cried because they were shedding sin. They were shedding everything that they've done wrong on their way to the temple. You see, inside the temple was the Holy of Holies. That's the most precious part of the temple. That is where they put the Ark of the Covenant, you know, Indiana Jones stuff, which contained the actual Ten Commandments handed down to God, to Moses. It was there that God dwelt among the Israelites and they knew they could not enter the presence of God with sin in their lives. So they walked along the valley and they weeped along the valley and they cried along the valley. And that's why they would sit there and they would completely try to shed sin. That's why they would sit there and cry over and over and over again, trying to shed sin. Do you understand? So they would sit there in this valley and they would try very desperately to completely do anything they could to shed their sin. As you walked as a young Jew through this valley on the way to the temple, you would be wary of what you drank wary of what you ate, wary about the girl that you promised you would marry but didn't just because you wanted something, wary of maybe a lie you told your brother to get some, some, some animals or some trade. Whatever sin they were involved with, they would begin to cry because the, the Spirit of God was so heavy that it would just manifest a repentant attitude. And these people living in the valley knew this. So they built their little huts there. They built their little shacks there. You know what they would do? They would wait for these Jews to come walking by. And then they would beg for money. So I don't know about you. If I'm trying to repent of some sort of sin, if I'm trying to do something absolutely like want to get right with God, I'm going to really, really be repenting through that valley. And they knew that. So what did they do? They set their little homes there and they begged for money, scavenging out an existence. If you want to hear about the valley, let's go old school. 
Please tell me Tyndale does not require internet access. Psalms 84. Psalms 84. When I first came to Christ, I used to call it Psalms. Let's go to Psalms 84. Psalms 84. We cut all the power because we couldn't stand the beeping. Psalms 84, 1 through 7. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of heaven's armies. I long, yes, I faint with longing to enter the courts of the Lord. With my whole body and soul, I will shout joyfully to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow builds her nest and raises her young at a place near your altar. O Lord of heaven's armies, my King and my God, what joy for those who can live in your house, always singing your praises. What joy for those whose strength comes from the Lord, who have set their minds on the pilgrimage to Jerusalem through the valley of Baca, when they walk through the valley of weeping. It's the valley of Baca. They call it the valley of weeping. It will become a place of refreshing springs. The autumn rains will clothe it with blessings. That is a very powerful scripture. Extremely powerful. Because what it really says is that God is going to build up springs in your desert place. God is going to change your situation if you have faith enough to pull out. There will be springs that will bubble up in the desert place. Spiritually, when Satan beats us down, when we lose our joy, when we're completely at the end of our rope, we are in the heat of a trial. Many of us are stuck at the entrance to this valley of weeping. We don't want to go in the valley because we're afraid of going in the valley. We want to hold on to our teddy bears of our past. We do not want to drop our sin because we've lived with them our entire life. Instead of wanting to repent of sin, they don't go into this valley behind me. But instead, they scavenge for an existence out of a dry and lifeless place with no joy, just like the pilgrims did when they were begging for money. We're hurting and we are weeping because of our sin and we're repenting because of our sin. But we need to enter this valley. People, they hurt so bad, but yet they still refuse to lay down on the altar. They still refuse to take the sin, their teddy bear, and place it on the altar. They're holding on to a teddy bear that they have had since childhood. They refuse to place that bear on the altar because they don't want to get rid of their sin. Spiritually, there are millions and millions of Christians locked at the entrance to the desert place, afraid to walk across the desert because they are afraid to shed their sin. What do you do when you've made it so far on the road to Christ, but now God wants you to drop your favorite sin? That's most of us, right? We're hurting and we are weeping because we are repenting of sin, either our own sin or someone else's sin. Even so, we still refuse to lay down the sin. We still refuse to lay down the teddy bear that God wants you to lay down. We are holding on to this dear thing since childhood. We refuse to put our teddy bear on the altar. Jesus Christ of Nazareth does not want your burnt offerings. What he wants is your sacrifice. What do you do when you've made it so far with Christ? You've made it so far, but now he wants you to sacrifice the one sin. That's most of us, right? But that's why we're here. That's why we're in the desert place, man. We're all, we're all in this place. Things are going well. It seems like your life is perfect. And then all of a sudden you find yourself in the desert place. You have been forced by God to enter the desert place because of a sin you refuse to drop. You have made a lifestyle around this sin, hiding it from everybody. On the other side of this desert place will be a door that God has left open for you. Behind you lies, back here, lies the remnants of a past life, a life you have knew before Jesus. 
all the sins, all your old habits, all the drinking, memories of things you had to do in the middle of the night to make ends meet, all your ways of life before you knew God are in your past. Now here you are in a place where God wants you to sacrifice that one sin, the one you have been holding on to, the one you love. He is forcing you to decide. He is forcing you to make another sacrifice. Do I go back to my comfort zone or do I go through the gate? Many believers today are experiencing the journey through the desert place spiritually. In the spirit, millions and millions and millions of us are weeping. Don't be embarrassed. Don't weep for me. I cry. I weep. Paul wept too. What is that scripture? Acts 20, what is it, Chris? Acts 20 what? 31. Acts 20, Acts 20, 31. I don't have my, my electronic stuff with me. I'm so sorry. Um, but therefore, Chris, can you read it? Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years, I ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears. He ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Some of us get anxious when God forces us to shed sin. We have carried the sin around so long without leaving it on the battlefield. And now God's forcing you to drop the one you don't want to drop. What do you do when God forces you to drop your favorite sin? Something you have held on to since your childhood. Something that got you through all the miserable jobs. Something that got you through every girl that broke your heart. Someone that got you through something. Maybe it was cigarettes. Maybe it was mead, weed. Maybe it was cocaine. We spent a lifetime holding on to this. But what do we do when God wants us to drop our favorite teddy bear and lay it on the altar? I'm telling you right now, you will never get your blessing. You will never step into the destiny that is waiting for you until you walk through the desert place and drop that sin. There are people here right now, they live out here. And God has slowly, slowly been pushing them into a drier desert place. You're afraid to walk in because you know the valley will purge you of your sin. You don't want to go in there because you know you're going to have to weep and you're going to have to repent. You can never walk into the promised land until you get out of your comfort zone and get in there. And for those of you willing to walk out of your comfort zone and get in there, God says he will do a new thing in your life. I promise you. God's promises are very, very clear to how we will be victorious, how we will be blessed, how we will be honored, how we will be just taken care of if we put him first. I'm kicking rocks back here because I hear a rattlesnake, for those of you, and that's like an old trick, whatever, but I just want them to don't come this way, man. So the snakes are trying to get me right now, so you better open up your Bible and push in, amen. We are promised that we will not be dry in the valley. The waters will bubble up. The autumn rains will come if you drop your sin. Refreshing rains will come. I promise you. In Psalms 30, uh, what is it, Chris? 30, 35. Psalms 35, it says, Weeping may endure by the, day, by the night, but joy comes in the morning. Amen? Joy comes in the morning. Our strength is insufficient, but God's supernatural strength and grace are completely sufficient. In Psalms 46, it says something like, God is our refuge, God is our strength, a very present help when you are deep in trouble. Hold on to that scripture. Hold on to the word of God. Hold on to every single promise that he has made you. Hold on to that. Because that is what gets you through. I know you're scared of going here. I look back on my life and I realize that the greatest breakthroughs I ever had was when I was willing to let go of my comfort zone and get in there. God wants us to learn how to follow him. He wants us to learn how to have faith in him. Sometimes it means, it means shedding that sin that you don't want to shed. It, he'll make it impossible for you to continue. He'll take everything away from you 
until you let it go, everything. You have to learn this. God is telling you, you cannot go into the next level of glory without leaving this sin on the altar. I know that time between the desert place and a blessing is so lonely. When you're out here all alone and it, and it gets dark and you're scared, it's like God's blessing takes an eternity to come. But you can do this. In Psalms 40, it says, I waited patiently on the Lord. Wait patiently on the Lord. Father God will hear your cry when you cry out to him. But drop your sin on the altar. There's a scripture. What's the lamentation scripture, Chris? Yeah, can you, brother? I'm so sorry. The Lord is good to everyone who trusts in him. So it is best for us to wait in patience, to wait for him to save us. And it is best to learn this patience in our youth. We need to learn to trust God. We need to get out of this. We need to learn that God will make a better way. Why? Because he loves you. But the longer you have to wait for your breakthrough, is the longer God's waiting on you to shed your teddy bear and place it on the altar. You have to place it on the altar, brothers and sisters. You know what else, <laughs> what else waiting does? It, 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 it points those that are watching you to the gospel. I've led so many people to Christ by them watching me come out of an epic disaster where everyone forgot about Phil. He would never make it out of that one. You know what I'm going to do? You know what I'm going to do? This is what I used to say. I'm going to get up. I'm going to pull my socks up. I'm going to put that sin on the altar. I'm going to put that teddy bear that I've been carrying around my entire life. And I am going to wait on the Lord patiently. There are so many reasons why people never get out of a desert place like this. They lose their faith. They fall into sin. You would not believe the stories. I know them all. When we lose our faith, the, the heat, the desert place becomes a prison. The heat of the world burns down on you. It gets hotter and hotter, and it gets more difficult to talk to Jesus. It's a dry and, and desolate place. Satan keeps beating down hard. When we first become a Christian, oh, the walk with Christ is very, very beautiful. There's so many friends and family there. It seems like all of your relatives are there. It seems like all of your friends are there. Oh my gosh, it's full of new believers, new Christians, old Christians reconnecting with Christ, people that just come around because they feel something, people that want to hear the word, and all sorts of souls are all crowded. But I'll tell you something. The walk in the beginning may be wonderful, but the road starts to get narrow. That road of grace that we were used to, people start dropping off. You will notice that people just seem to come and go. People we came to Christ with, people we thought we'd never live without, people who helped us get on the worship team, people who taught us, people who prayed for us, people that we thought, oh my gosh, their faith is so strong. Now they have been backslidden into the world. This happens because Satan begins beating down and beating down and beating down on us until we have nothing left. He keeps kicking us in the teeth, kicking us in the teeth. You want to know why Satan's beating you up? Because you have got a calling on your life. Why would you sit there in a desert place and scavenge out a living? Do what you have to do. Do what you have to do. What do you do when the pastor's been to your house 20 times? The worship leader's been to your house. All the Bible leadership has been to your house. Your mother-in-law's been to your house. Everyone has prayed for you into an exhaustion. Years have gone by. And you're still in the desert place. The world, the heat of the world starts to pull on believers. Satan starts to lure them, and pretty soon, the people you came to Christ with are gone. Some, he gets to leave the road completely. I know people that'll 
I shouldn't speak this, but I don't think they'll ever come back to Christ. I don't think they'll ever, good Lord. Shh. I don't think they'll ever come back to Christ. No. <laughs> Some he can push off the road to Christ a little bit because he's trying to steal years from them so they won't be effective. That's what he did to me. He bumped me off the road for decades. So now this is why I'm so on fire for Christ is because I'm making up for lost time. But now you're back in a desert place again. Why? Because you still got to drop that sin. It's all alone in the wilderness out here, man. I'm telling you, I've been in Israel late at night, in desert places like this. And I know what David's talking about now in the Old Testament. You can hear the jackals howl. You can hear them. Now, how do we make it out? What do we got to do to get out of here? Well, I'm going to tell you, brothers and sisters, repent, repent, repent. Take the sin, and you know what I'm talking about, and lay that sin once and for all on the altar. Once and for all. What's the next scripture, brother? Uh, Acts 3.19. Uh, he's going he's gonna to wipe out your sins. Please read it, brother. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Trust in the Lord, not in your own understanding. Amen, amen, amen. Trust in the Lord and not in your own understanding. Why is it so tempting for us to depend on our own wisdom than that wisdom of God? What makes us think that we know better than God about how to get out of this place? What makes us think that we're smarter than God? Let me tell you something. Seasons of waiting in the desert place reveal, I'll tell you what, it, it reveals who we are placing our trust with. Waiting in the desert place reveals more to, about us than anything. So when you see people living in the desert place like this for 10, 15, 20 years, they don't want to get rid of their teddy bear. How many brothers and sisters do you know in the same place? They don't want to get rid of their teddy bear. Psalms 27 says, be strong, be strong and take courage. I found that one of my biggest battles in long seasons of waiting is fighting fear. And all of fear's friends. My gosh, fear's got some good friends, man. Anxiety, liars, the boom, boom room, unfaithfulness, worry. Satan asks, what if this happens? What if that happens? What if God doesn't bail you out of this? What if God's going to help you? You know what the gospel has taught me? You will never get out of here unless you put your faith in Jesus Christ. You will never have the strength. You will spend decades of your life trying to do it with your brain. You have to do it with Jesus Christ. You can remain in the desert place where you have learned to scratch out a living. You can remain in the desert place where you've learned to just scratch out a living. You don't want to be here, do you? You don't want to remain here, do you? This is a dry and desolate place. This is not a good place to live. You don't want to pitch dents in the desert place. All you need to do to get out of here is keep your faith and walk with Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus and you can walk completely out of the desert place. There are promises for all of you that you can hold on to. Isaiah 45, 2 through 3 says, go ahead, Chris. I will go before you and will level the mountains. I will break down gates of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you hidden treasures, riches stored in secret places, so that you may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel who summons you by name. If you have taken your teddy bear and you have placed that teddy bear on the altar and you've sacrificed that sin for Jesus, God wants you to know you don't have to worry. 
God wants you to know you do not have to live in doubt. You will get out of the desert place. You thought you could live here with your teddy bear your entire life. No. All of a sudden, your circumstances have changed. All of a sudden, life has gotten hard for you. That is God telling you to lay it on the line. Sometimes, with your back up against the wall, you've got to lay it on the line, baby. Otherwise, you don't get anything from God. You can only get so far on the grace highway before he's going to want that sin. He's going to want it. You know what I'm talking about. Like the Jews 2,000 years ago, you are going to need to confess your sins. You're going to need to leave behind the big one on the altar. Make it through the other side and you will be able to walk through that door that God has opened for you. It's a beautiful door. That is why most people are stuck in the same place where they were 20 years ago. That's why you, I know these people. They're stuck in the same place. They don't want to shed their sin. They are afraid to take a risk and leave that comfort zone behind. When you're going through, it may be very, very uncomfortable. It may be very, very hard. Could be IRS stuff. Could be family stuff. Could be illnesses. You've lost your business because it is stupid disease. Everything seems hard. You don't know the world you live in. They've got us all on 5Gs. Now they're even hiding the poles and making them look like trees. I'm writing this little poem that rhymes. It's beautiful. It's great. Oh, but they're doing it so it blends in, doesn't look so ugly. Right, yeah. They're doing it so your kid and my kid won't even know what they are one day. You're in a desert place. What are you going through may be very uncomfortable. But when you make it to the other side of this desert, it's going to be so beautiful. You can't imagine the blessings God has in store for you when you make it across this desert place. Let's go to Philippians. What is it? Philippians 4, 6, 7. Can you read it, Chris? Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Amen. And the peace of God, will tra which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ loves you. These, there's like snakes back here, guys. They leave me alone for two minutes if I do that. Listen, it's a little rough tonight, I know. I'm sorry. Jesus Christ loves you. Jesus Christ loves you. If you lay this sin on the altar, if you really lay this sin on the altar, God is going to give you so much wisdom, so much grace, so much peace, so much joy, you would never even understand how much peace it's going to give you. You're going to be able to navigate your way out of the desert place. You will be able to find your way out of this place. And there will be blessings on the other side. I want every one of you to know that when Jesus Christ was nailed to that cross, when the blood was running down his hands, down his ankles, dripping on the ground, that blood was for you. Don't scavenge out an existence here. Don't do that. He loves you. Repent. Let's pray. Dear Father God, dear Lord Heaven, thank you so much, Jesus, for this place that we're in. Father God, thank you for getting us into this desert place. We found a little private place, Lord, with wild horses. We were able to get in here. I'm grateful, Father God. Thank you, Jesus. Father God, I pray for everyone that's out there in the Internet world. Father God, I pray that they lay down their sin right at the altar, Father God, and push in. I pray, Father God, that they get out of the desert place, that they find water, which can only be found in the Word, your Word, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for this place. And God bless you. Amen.
God bless you and thank you so much for tuning in to Jesus Lives to hear the word of God from a sinner like me who was redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Please check out the website, the YouTube, the Facebook, and hit us up with any prayer request. I promise you, I pray over every single one of those and I'll pray over yours too. God bless you and have a pleasant day.